Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Today, we'll be looking at the 34 mile long M9 motorway. It provides a vital link between Edinburgh and Stirling, and it was constructed over a period of 15 years, between 1965 and 1980, although some tweaks have been made here and there as late as 2023. The first section of the M9 to open ran from today's Junction 4 up to the A88, however the starting point of the M9 would be completed in 1970. And it was crap. The arrangement of motorways back then was very different to what we have today, and all of the problems seemed to be down to Junction 1 of the M9, aka the Newbridge Roundabout. The issue was that the roundabout was also Junction 1 of the M8, so you had two motorways terminating on either side of the roundabout, and that's a stupid idea. Luckily, they realised that they'd made a bit of an error rushing to solve the problem 25 years later. The solution was to build a proper grade separated junction to replace the standard roundabout that had caused nothing but problems since its initial construction. At the same time, the M8 motorway was having an extension built, so they added another set of slip roads giving us the interchange that we see today. The perhaps oddly placed slip road that we see at Junction 1 is a small reminder of the original layout of the M9. Rather than continuing through the junction, you'd have been forced down this slip road to the motorway's end at the Newbridge roundabout. Junction 1A used to be Junction 1. In 1970, they'd only completed the M9 from the Newbridge roundabout up to where we find today's Junction 1A, so it makes sense that it used to be Junction 1. Today, the junction serves as an interchange between the M9 and the M90 motorways, but back then, the M90 motorway didn't exist. Instead, the M9 had a strange spur linking it to a roundabout at the B800, and to the west, they installed a temporary slip road connecting the M9 to the B9080. The temporary slip road would only be in place until 1972, such as the definition of temporary. The odd M9 spur would stay in place until 2007, when it was extended to connect up with the A90, where it would then become part of the M90 motorway. Motorway. Whilst they were doing all of that, they installed a much needed set of slip roads at Junction 1A that had been missing since its initial construction. Just as you pass Junction 2, have a look out on your right and you might spot the Binns Tower. It sits on the highest point of a 200 acre estate known as Binns House or the House of Binns. Now it's not Binns as in rubbish, the word is derived from Benz, the Gaelic word for hills, so it could be called the House of the Hills. And to be fair, if you say Benz with a Scottish accent, it sounds like Benz, doesn't it? Records suggest that there's been a manor house of sorts located here since the late 1470s, but by comparison, the tower is a modern structure, having been built in the 1820s. Of course, this makes the tower over 200 years old. The reason why it's looking as good as new is because in 2007, the tower had a full restoration. Junction 4 is where we start to drive along the oldest section of the M9, having opened in 1968. It ran from here up to the A88, back then the A876, where it would terminate at a roundabout that was built as a temporary measure whilst they built the rest. At the Junction 4 end, the motorway would be connected up by 1972, but where they'd set up the temporary roundabout, well, that wouldn't be sorted until 1980. This stretch of early M9 motorway remains pretty much as it was upon opening. Junctions 4 and 5 have still got the same layout that they've always had. But junction 5 is quite unique because one of its slip roads had to be built away from the main junction due to space constraints. Junction 6 also offers a unique junction opportunity. First, it's missing a set of slip roads, and the others appear to have been drawn in at random to suit whatever space was available at the time. This isn't really much of a surprise given that the motorway is squeezed in alongside the town of Grangemouth, and again, the junction remains unchanged since its original construction. Grangemouth is home to the largest container port in Scotland, handling around 9 million tonnes of cargo every year. But the main source of income for the town of Grangemouth surely has to be the massive Grangemouth refinery. You'll spot it at various points along the M9 motorway, but usually from Junction 4 onwards. With its massive cooling towers and several gas flares, it's definitely a significant landmark. Production started at the site in 1924, but for some reason they were forced to close between the years of 1939 and 1945. No bother though, they would reopen for business in 1946 with plans to drastically expand the site. Part of the expansion involved building a 58 mile long pipeline to deliver the finished product to an oil terminal on the other side of Scotland where it could be loaded onto boats for export. It must have been a good idea because in the 1990s they added a second pipeline. Just after Junction 6 is another significant landmark, although this one a little bit less pollutey. It's called the Kelpies or the Kelpies and well, it's two massive horse heads that stare at you directly in the face as you drive along the M9. Regular viewers might recognise the galvanised steel construction. It's the same material that was used to make Aria, another landmark that sits alongside the M80. But what are these landmarks exactly? Well, they're art installations or sculptures if you prefer, created by Glaswegian-born artist and sculptor Andy Scott. 
The art installation that sits alongside the M9 is known as the Kelpies or the Kelpies, I'm not really sure, and it was completed in 2014. The horse heads stand at 30 metres high and each of them weighs 300 tonnes. I'm sure there are many artistic reasons as to why you'd build a set of massive horse heads next to a motorway, but I don't really care about any of that. They look good though, and in their first year of opening attracted over 1 million visitors. The Kelpies, or Kelpies, whatever, sits right next to the River Karen and a canal connection that runs right through the town of Falkirk. If we follow the canal along, we arrive at something that, if I didn't mention it, the comments would be awash with angry Falkirkians. As soon as the camera comes out, everybody congregates. Whilst you can't see it from the M9, if you're in the area, it's worth the trip to visit the Falkirk Wheel. It's brilliant. It's possibly the most over-engineered solution to a canal lock ever. It's a rotating boat lift that opened in 2002 as part of a project to reconnect and reopen two canals that had fallen into disrepair. It was funded mostly by the National Lottery, and, well, if it's not your money, this is what you get, an extravagant rotating lift that can raise and lower boats by 24 metres. The bits that carry the boats are called gondolas. There are two of them, and they weigh 50 tonnes each. Not only that, they can both carry up to 500 tonnes of boat and water. It's the only boat lift of its type in the world, and here it is in tiny Falkirk. Does it serve any real purpose? Not really, but it's a nice thing to have. Junction 7 to 9 was the last section of the M9 to open in 1980. Earlier, we mentioned a temporary roundabout to the A88 or the A876. This used to be Junction 7, but was removed to make way for the motorway's extension up to Junction 9, where it met an already constructed piece of the motorway. The drive up to Junction 9 is a mostly uneventful one, with the motorway making its way through open countryside. But once you get to Junction 9, it gets a bit strange. In order to remain on the main carriageway of the M9, you need to leave the main carriageway of the M9 and then rejoin it a bit further up. The reason it does this is because of the M80 motorway which merges with the M9 at this junction, but I wonder if there are alternative plans drawn up for the junction. I don't know for sure, but it looks to me like the M9 carriageway has had space left for it to be extended to the west. This might explain the odd layout to the junction and interchange, maybe it was never completed as planned. The problem's that I can't find any plans to say either way, so it's a bit of a mystery. If you've got any ideas, let me know. At Junction 10, we find the old Prudential office building. It's not this, it's this. Over the years, it's become a bit of a landmark for motorway travellers and the residents of Stirling, but it's not going to be around for much longer. The site was built in the 1970s over an area of 54 acres. At its peak, it would have employed around 3,000 people, but the organisations that work within have moved all of their operations to a brand new site on the other side of the M9. Earlier this year, the site suffered at the hand of vandals. Accordingly, security has been increased, with calls made to demolish the entire thing. And that seems very likely, because plans have been submitted to redevelop the entire area with new houses, new hotels, new leisure facilities, you know, usual new build type stuff. Do you remember earlier when I said people congregate around cameras? There's been f***ing nobody here for the last 20 minutes, but as soon as I set the camera up... As you head away from Junction 10, the M9 crosses over the River Forth, and if you take a look out to your right, you'll probably spot the Wallace Monument towering over the town of Stirling. This 67-metre-high Victorian Gothic-style tower was completed in 1869 to commemorate Wallace. No mention of Gromit, though. Shame. Just kidding. I'm referring, of course, to Sir William Wallace, a 13th-century Scottish hero. Apparently, a number of Wallace's artefacts are on display within the monument. I'm not sure because I wasn't prepared to pay the entrance fee, but one of the artefacts on display is the Wallace sword. But if they'd care to watch my previous video, they'd know that the Wallace sword is in fact sat by the M80 motorway. In 1996, a statue was unveiled in the visitor car park depicting Mel Gibson playing William Wallace. Unfortunately, it's been moved now, so I can't show you, but it's said to be the most loathed piece of public art in the whole of Scotland. Back to the motorway, and the M9 just comes to an end at a roundabout or Junction 11, and for a while, that was about it. This section of M9 motorway and the junction opened in 1971, and at the time, the A9 dual carriageway that we find on the other side of the junction didn't exist. Instead, the A9 was a much smaller local road that followed the route of today's B8033 into Dunblane. In 1990, the A9 was upgraded to a dual carriageway and built along a new alignment, which is what gives us the junction we see today. And there we are then, guys. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is, of course, a button specifically for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. That'd be wicked sweet awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John. You've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.